Long before the white man set foot on the Western world, the coast of North Africa was the homeland of a tough, warlike branch of his race called the Berbers. In small boats, generally rowed by prisoners taken in warfare, they raided the much larger ship of the Europeans and made their name the dread of all who sailed the Mediterranean. Cannon, captured from their enemy, as well as more ancient catapults that threw Greek fire into the opposing craft, generally opened the battle as the craft closed in. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting by boarding parties all too often finished it. This is the way naval warfare looked only six centuries ago in a manner of speaking only yesterday in the long train of empires that rose and fell on these shores. But we go back much further as we watch an international scientific expedition dig into the ruins on the site of ancient Carthage. Many thousands of tons of earth and debris have been removed to reveal the glories of civilizations long since buried under the garbage of their conquerors. The archaeologist studies the life of ancient peoples from their relics left behind in buried cities, often in their refuse dumps, and graves reveal much important knowledge of the past that should serve as lessons for the future. Here in Carthage, we find the relics not of one buried city, but of seven, one on top of the other. We can thus trace the story of how a Phoenician Semitic people invaded these shores to build a proud capital from which they dominated the then known world and how their great land armies were laid low by the naval strength of the young Roman nation. Rome, in turn, bowed before later invaders, Vandal, Byzantine, and Arab. On this one spot, we can trace a sort of layer cake of civilization, literally, each new layer stealing from the one that went before, while destroying and burying that which it could make its own. By digging long and deep, we learned that first there came the original Libyans. Then about a thousand years B.C., the Carthaginians. Then the Romans, who destroyed their rival city only to rebuild it with all the added cultural riches of Greece and Rome. Then came the Vandals, barbarians from northern Europe, who simply destroyed everything and left nothing. The Byzantine Empire knew glories only to give way to the conquering Arabs, who in turn were ousted during the Crusades. Their conquest was succeeded by the Barbary pirates, then in turn by the Turks, and then by the French. Even the American Navy in 1815 had a hand in changing power relationship on this coast, and in the global war, American armed forces became a spearhead to beat back the Nazi fascist attempt to build still another invader empire on the ruins of those we are about to uncover. Here is an interesting curse stone, carved with Punic maledictions against anyone who might disturb it. And as soon as an inscription like this is found, we make a squeeze of it with wet paper, so that experts can get to work at once to decipher its meaning. So dire were the threats on this stone that our Arab diggers refused to dig further until they got a raise in wages. Our excavations in the temple of Tanit and Moloch disclose the inscriptions relating to the family of Hannibal, the greatest of all Carthaginian generals. This work must be done with the greatest care. Thousands of tons of earth have to be brushed and sifted so that not even the smallest coin, jewel, or other relic may be lost. One of the most amazing of all our finds was the temple of the goddess Tanit, the equivalent of the Phoenician Astarte and consort of the terrible god Moloch. In these temple ruins we found urns, at first just a few, and then we dug further. There were hundreds, yes, thousands of them, each containing the bones and ashes of a child that had been sacrificed to these gods. In time of famine or war, the parents were forced to sacrifice their most precious possessions, so we find in many of these carefully sealed urns marvelous jewels and other riches, plus the bones of their firstborn. In three years' work, here we uncovered 18,000 of these horror relics. 
A more pleasant discovery followed the raising of this 3,000 pound stone that sealed the grave of a dancing girl. Her remains were surrounded by the gifts of her admirers of 30 centuries ago. Great amphor or wine jugs once filled with the richest vintages of North Africa. Many perfume bottles too, and rouge, and other cosmetic containers. She was buried with her fine jewels, even with her golden dancing symbols, so that she might be sure to delight the admirers in the next world as she had in this one. Priceless are the ornaments found in this grave. She literally had rings on her fingers and bells on her toes. Digging deeper into civilization's layer cake, we find the pottery works of the Phoenician epoch in North African occupation. A great mass of pottery has been protected through the centuries under its steep blanket of sand and earth. Among our finds, a child savings bank, very much like the little piggy banks of our own time, and with it six coins, the date 300 BC. Many children's toys too, that tell much about the customs of the elders as well, for even then did the toys of the young copy the implements of the adults. Milk bottles in those days were used like this. High in the mound we found the house where Cato, the Roman philosopher who opposed Caesar, committed suicide. Here we found some marvelous frescoes and historical manuscripts. Such houses also disclose gorgeous mosaic floors, paintings in stone made of bits of smooth marble of many colors. In viewing this picture you are sharing one of the great thrills of an archaeologist's life, the original disclosure of an important link in mankind's chain of culture. Such mosaics often depict battle scenes, hunting scenes, and other phases of ancient life. They are real works of art. But we are searching for a still earlier chapter in the history of man in North Africa. Who knows but that we may be able to go back far enough to find there the very cradle of our race. This strange land in southern Tunisia was once covered by the sea. We cross over a hundred miles of inland salt lakes, dangerous, sparsely peopled country where whole caravans have been lost without trace. The few Bedouins we met gave us but little help. En route, at Medanin, in the Matmata Mountains, we see some very strange dwellings. They are the skyscrapers of the Sahara, some of them 14 stories high and built of salt and mud. It hardly ever rains here. In fact, the Berbers hope it won't, for a heavy rain would melt their houses. All water comes from deep wells. These are the native people of this section of North Africa and have lived here from time immemorial with little change in their way of life. A favorite tidbit in the native diet is the live scorpion. Yes, they eat them alive. It is not easy to climb the steep, exposed stairways. These dwellings are fortresses too, and the stairs can be destroyed quickly in case of attack. The old Berber defense trenches came into military use again only recently. This is the famous Marath line. When cars can go no further, we take to donkeys, tough little beasts, who can carry even the heaviest of our party, if we don't let our feet hang. But we want to turn back our story still further. So we journey to the land of the troglodytes, or cave dwellers. Thousands of people live underground here, just as they must have lived for countless centuries. Their homes go down six and even seven stories in some cases for protection against the hostile nomad tribes. They keep their livestock underground also. Back still further to the valley of 10,000 caves, the home of the men of the old stone age, now inhabited only by hyenas, jackals, and vampire bats. But the Paleolithic drawings that cover the cave walls tell us that 50,000 years or more ago, this region was no desert, but a country of rivers and forests and much wildlife that supported a large human population. Once more, we dig into a layer cake of forgotten culture. Layer on layer, we work our way down to uncover, literally, thousands of flint implements. Some of the implements are of great size. Their users must have been tremendously strong. This whole region of southern Tunisia and Algeria 
deserves much further study. It may well prove to have been the true cradle of the human race. Our explorations follow the course of the ancient riverbeds until they are lost in the great sand wastes of the Sahara, that greatest of all expanses of sand on the Earth's surface, larger than the whole of the United States, was also once a land of countless lakes. Its mountains and canyons still remind us of the time when streams rushed through vividly colored gorges on their way to those lakes. But the waters rush no more, and the lake country of old is now 3,000 miles of shifting sand. We will explore that country and its strange people at another time. Our desert friends on their beautiful Arab steeds escort us back to civilization. We have explored many thousands of miles and brought back for science many wonderful specimens of the history of men from this land of gold and sand and ruins.